Good evening, everybody. We're meeting in Gallery again to um, do our Bible study. It's only our second week of doing it this way, uh, something still quite new and fresh. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 2 tonight. But as we stop and as we gather, let's just pause for prayer at this time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity again to meet together. Lord, at the, at the tail end of a busy day, um, we're just grateful for this chance to pause and to reflect upon your words, upon what you're saying to us, what, what it means to us. We just pray that you would give us wisdom and insight as we look at this together. Lord, just thank you for your blessings upon us. Um, thank you for the blessings of this day. Thank you for the blessing of having your word, which we can so freely read and share with one another. Lord, we pray now that you would just guide us and direct us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, I did say last week when I was doing the video, uh, doing the Bible study, that if you had any questions in relation to Hebrews 1 to get in touch, uh, either phone or text or whatever, um, I, I didn't get any messages, so I take that as a good thing. And hopefully it was straightforward and clear enough about what we were saying. Uh, but again, at any stage, if there's any questions, please just drop me a little line. Um, I recorded last week and this obviously is a recorded video again, so you can't ask me, ask me as we're ha happening. Um, but hopefully we'll get to do a few of these live as such, where we can actually do that as we go along. Uh, but if there are any questions, please just ask at any stage. Just as we start, let me just read the first um, number of verses from Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, let me read down to verse 10, end of verse 10. Uh, and then let's look at some of these verses together. We'll not get as far as that probably in, in this period of time, but we'll just see how far we get. This is Hebrews 2. So we must listen very carefully to the truth that we have heard, or we may drift away from it. The message God delivered through angels has always stood firm and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak? And God confirmed this message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. Jesus the man. And furthermore, it is not angels who will control the future world we are talking about. For in one place the scriptures say, What are mere mortals that we should think about them? Or the son of man that you should care for him? Yet for a little while you made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You gave them authority over all things. Now when it says all things, it means nothing is left out. But we have not yet seen all things put under their authority. What do we see? What we do see is Jesus, who for a little while was given a position a little lower than the angels. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honour. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it is only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. Amen. That's the end of verse 10. Hebrews 1 very much sets out who Jesus is and gave us the evidence that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is exactly who God promised the Messiah. The reason for doing that probably was because the writer was reading was the writer was sending his letter to Jews um, who obviously a lot of them didn't believe Jesus as Messiah, but reaffirming that, just reminding them, those who have turned to uh, Christianity, that Jesus is the Messiah. And you need to get a reflection of that now in this first verse. We must listen carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. Maybe some of them were wavering. Maybe some of them were starting to drift back to the old ways um, of the Jewish law. Maybe some of them were starting to, to wonder and doubt. Uh, maybe somebody had been sowing seeds of doubts in their head. Somebody was trying to, to change the word and corrupt it for their own means. Uh, because they thought, which a lot of Jews did, that, that Jesus was 
and the, and the disciples were corrupting the Jewish people. They didn't see it as a promise. So maybe that's what was going on here. Maybe that's why in this verse um, he says, listen carefully so we may not drift away from what the truth is. The truth of Jesus being Messiah. He goes on to say, for the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm. Now you wonder maybe what was the message that God delivered through the angels? Well, when you think about the Old Testament and the Old Testament being written, and as you think what is written in the New Testament about God's words, um, the new, the um, King James Version would have said, all scripture is given by inspiration. A modern translation would say, all scripture is God breathed or breathed out for God or spoken out from God. It, it's that sense that God gave what was written to the people to write. So that this message of God delivered through angels, uh, it's saying that the angels were were prompting, were showing the people what to write. So that it's the message of God delivered by angels. So the Old Testament is God's word. Um, what is written by the, the Old Testament in the, in the books of law and prophets and the Psalms and everything else that goes on there, it, it is God's word. It's not man's word, it's God's word. And it's delivered through angels, so how, how people are prompted to write. And it says about every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. That's true. You mean very much the Old Testament, you see punishment, you see law, you, you see them being set down as a standard. Um, and that's why sometimes people think about the Old and New Testament being very separate. The Old Testament is about punishment, about law. The New Testament is about uh, forgiveness. But when you actually read the New Testament as well, it, yes, forgiveness is there. The means of forgiveness is there through Jesus, um, through, th through what we call God's grace being poured out through the cross. But at the same time, there's still punishment, there's still judgment. You just get to the end of, get to the, end of the New Testament, read Revelations, um, and, and you see that. But even look at what is written in the New Testament, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, it, the New Testament doesn't say that there's not there's not punishment. It, it, it undermines, in fact, the punishment. But the New Testament shows us where that hope is. But that hope is also in the Old Testament. So they are, they are linked so much. So the message of God, delivered through the angels, is stood firm by law. So what makes us think that we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced through the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak. You know, it's, it's a case of, yeah, hang on here a minute, folks. Do, do you really think that this doesn't apply to you? Do you really think that what the Old Testament says about the punishment, but then about he was bruised for our transgression, by, by his wounds we are healed? We all like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has led on him the iniquity of us all. When you think of what is written in the Old Testament, do you think that you can ignore that? Do you think that you can just follow the old ways of, of doing sacrifices and everything will be fine? No, you need to look at the fulfilment of those prophecies. You need to look at the fulfilment of what God says. And, and that's what comes through here. It was announced by Jesus Christ himself. Jesus talks about the coming of God's kingdom and how it starts off as small as the mustard seed, but will grow. Jesus coming was that mustard seed. Jesus was that kingdom being seen and the means of salvation. And then how we are saved. And it says that Jesus announced it himself, first of all, which he did. And then delivered to us uh, by those who heard him speak. Look at the, uh, the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Those who heard Jesus speak and who have written it down. It was recorded for us. And that's what God is saying through this passage. And then it goes on to say, And God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. Look at the signs and the wonders and the miracles that Jesus performed. Look at how uh, the, the disciples continue that and what they do. Uh, look at the gifting which is given. And those gifts are with us today still. 
And through those gifts, we see how God cares for us and how God loves us. And we share the message of God's love. Unfortunately, in this world, we quite often, and people quite often, close their eyes to what they see around them. They like to rationalise it uh, and they like to be able to explain it all, but you can't. That's why they're called signs and wonders and various miracles. We can't explain them. They are something which is extraordinary. And and it's, it's choosing to accept them and choosing to accept where they've come from. And all of them point to God being our God, Jesus being the saviour, and that we have salvation through what Christ has done. Look at Jesus himself, giving up his life on the cross, dying on it, being buried in a tomb, and then rising to new life. Rising to be changed and transformed, to be the first one who has risen again in a transformed body to go to be at God's right hand. That's what it's all about. And, and and what God says there stands out and speaks to all of us for that. The passage goes on to say, and furthermore, it is not angels who will control the future world we're talking about. So again, it, it's it's nearly like trying to dispel a myth about who the angels are and what the angels do. And by saying it's not the angels who do all this, it's God. The angels are created by God. The angels are messengers of God. The angels just simply do God's bidding, but it's God who has done all this for us. So the writer of Hebrews, again, quotes scriptures that we will understand. It says, for in one place, the scriptures say, what are mere mortals that we should think about them? Or the son of man that we should care for him? Yet for a little while, you were made lower than the angels and crowned with glory and honour. You gave them authority over all things. And that's a quote taken from Psalm 8. Verses four to six, talking about us as beings, as, as people, how we create a little lower than the angels and how we were, were given authority over things on earth. All you've got to do is look back to Genesis and reflect upon what God says in Genesis about how we are to look after his creation, how we are to care for it and be there for it. I, I, and how you know Adam was was to name the animals and and to to give them that that role, and then it goes on to say now when it says all things it means nothing is left out, but we have not yet seen all things put under their authority. Uh, what we do see is Jesus for a little while has given a position a little lower than the angels because he suffered death for us. He's now crowned with glory and honor. When you think about the world that we live in, I'm saying about all things being under our authority. Um, that's the way God wanted things to be. But unfortunately, we sinned. Unfortunately, we turned our back on God. Um, Unfortunately, Adam and Eve listened to Satan. And hence, Satan gets called the prince of this world. And we see Satan as having power and authority in this world. If you think of how he tempted Jesus, if you think about um, how he said to Jesus, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you all that you see. Uh, and Jesus rejecting that, obviously, and, and turning away from it. But it's recognising that in this world that we live, because of sin and corruption, yes, Satan does have power. Satan does have authority. Um, but that is temporary. Because Jesus and what he has done has shown that sin is defeated. Uh, and Jesus will win that battle. Uh, that's what revelation is all about the the, the 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 battle between good and evil and, and here's the spoiler if if you don't like turning to the last page of a book and reading the last page and finding out the plot twist and, and the plot ending well revelations does that for you it tells you that evil is defeated um, evil is eternally vanquished and that goodness reigns but in that again there is judgment there is those who have followed and accepted god's um, who dwell with him, and there's those who are, as it puts it, eternally damned, uh, who are judged and who are separated from God. It's it's not a politically correct thing to talk about heaven and hell, but being talk about judgments. Um, so many people think, oh, we'll all be fine in the end, but the Bible doesn't teach that. Uh, and, and as we try to get our heads around what heaven is like and what hell will be like, um, are the images right? Is it you know? Is it all about gold? Is it all about burning fire? 
let's put it in simple terms. Um, heaven is the place where God is. Hell is the place where God isn't. Heaven is the place where you will be in basking in God's presence and in his glory and in his light. Hell is the place of darkness. And it's, it's where do you want to be? Do you want to be with God? Or do you want to be separated from God? And, it, and it's, you know, that's coming through and that, you know, everything will be placed under his authority. It says it's only right that he, that's God, should make Jesus through his suffering a perfect leader fit to bring them into their salvation. It's only right because Jesus was the only one who could do this for us. Jesus was the only one who could have our sins forgiven because Jesus is the only perfect person who hasn't sinned. So it's just right that he is the one who dies for us. He is the one who pays the price and who ascends to heaven and who sits at God's right hand to intercede for us. That he is the leader. And again in Revelations, Jesus rides out as the, the, the rider on the white horse, the one who leads the, the army into battle and who leads the army to victory. And it says, fit to bring them into their salvation. He's the one through whom we are saved. These are wonderful verses as you read them. Wonderful because of what they say about Jesus. And again, affirming exactly who Jesus is and what he has done for us. We live in a world that either dismisses Jesus or says, oh, he was a good person. Maybe he lived, maybe he didn't live. Maybe somebody made him up. But if he did live, he was a good person. No, scripture says Jesus wasn't a good person. He was God's son. That he wasn't just somebody who lived for a while, but he is the leader of God's heavenly army. Army. He's the one who's the only one who is fit to bring us salvation because he's the only one who is perfect. And yes, eventually everything will be under his power and authority. And it's sort of a case of, you know, well, who are you going to follow? Are you going to follow the old ways? Which Jesus has actually come and Jesus himself said about the new covenant. Um, in John 14, whenever he talks to his, um, this, uh, John 14, John 15, just he talks to his disciples. Are we going to be under that new covenant? Are we going to be under the old covenant? Are we going to think of following the old ways? And not following Christ. You know that's what this talks about. Following Christ. So yeah folks tonight's study. Is just that wee bit shorter before we go into anything more. But I just want to leave it there and park it there for tonight. And just say to you. Reflect upon that. You know go back and read that again. The version I read to you was from the New Living Translation. Maybe your words will seem slightly different. If you flick to the Psalms to read that passage. It will read slightly differently. Because. Um, the quote that is in the New Testament is the Greek version of the Psalms. So the wording will be slightly different, but the meaning is still the same. And, and, and that's the thing, whenever we see different quotes, sometimes whenever we flick to the Old Testament, it might seem slightly differently. But we've got to remember how the Bible was translated and how it's written and recorded um, between Hebrew and Greek. But the meaning doesn't change. The meaning is still there and the understanding is still the same who God is and what he's done for us through his son, Jesus. Let's give thanks to God for his son. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is your son. Thank you that he is our saviour and our Messiah. Thank you that he did die to take away our sins for forgiveness. Lord, help us not to lose sight of that. Help us not to lose sight of the truth of your word. Help us to keep focused upon that at all times and help us to keep reminding ourselves of the truths that we find in your word. And Lord, as we take time to read your word, please reveal those truths to us, we pray. In Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining with me again tonight. And we'll be back and we'll do this again next Wednesday. We'll pick it up from verse 11. Um, chapter 2 goes down into verse 18. Maybe we'll get through all those verses. Maybe we won't. Uh, we'll just take it one week at a time and see how we get on. But I hope you enjoy that, that, that short study. And it gives you food for thought about Jesus and what he's done for us and what it means to follow him. Take care, folks. God bless.